Hello and welcome to another episode of the Breakthrough Science Society. Today we are here with Professor Shomitra Banerjee, who is a renowned scientist in the field of nonlinear dynamics and bifurcation theory. He is a full time professor at ISAR Kolkata in the Department of Physical Sciences. He is also the General Secretary of the Breakthrough Science Society. And this Breakthrough Science Society is a social welfare organization which is motivated towards the propagation of scientific culture in India. Today we are going to discuss about the national education policy which was newly introduced by the Indian government and the ideas related to the Indian knowledge system. So without further ado, let us begin. So Professor Banerjee, what is the idea of the national education policy and what is the idea related to the Indian knowledge system according to the people who have framed this policy and who are trying to implement it? Well, in a national education policy is something that gives a direction to the education system. And uh, education policies have been framed in 1968, 1986, and now in 2020. This time, in the new education policy, there are various issues in the education policy, but one thing runs through the education policy is something that they are terming as Indian knowledge system. And uh, they are planning to introduce that in the secondary as well as levels of uh, education system. And to facilitate that, uh, the proposal is to introduce Sanskrit as a subject to be learned not only in school but in college but in university and it will be sort of uh, available to all disciplines. So the whole idea is to introduce something called the Indian knowledge system in the curriculum framework. Now what, as you, as you asked, what do they really understand by that? The education policy itself does not elaborate on that. But those who are implementing the policy, they have in a few occasions elaborated what their ideas are regarding the Indian knowledge system. For example, in the last November, November 2020, there was a uh, conference organized on this issue at IIT Kharagpur, in which the Minister of Education was invited, important dignitaries of the education policy makers, they were invited and spoke. And from there, it is clear that the idea of the Indian knowledge system is something, uh, in their ideas, is that in the very distant past, according to them, the Vedic times, India was very advanced in science and technology. And it is that they are trying to uh, communicate to the younger generation. That's what the main idea is. And in various occasions, many of the ministers and other important people have elaborated their ideas on what on what account India was advanced. For example, uh, in this particular conference, it was discussed that in the Mahabharata and many other texts, we have talked about Pushpak Vimana. So, the idea is that then aircraft must have existed at that time. A few years back, the education minister, the minister of state of education, uh, Satyapal Singh, he said that he does not believe in Darwin's theory. Why? Because uh, he has not seen any monkey being converted into a man. A few years back, the chief minister of Tripura said that in the time of Mahabharata, there must have been television and internet because Sanjay was giving a running commentary of the, of the events of the war to the blind king. So therefore, that must be possible only if TV and internet were there. And then the prime minister himself, while inaugurating one uh, hospital in Mumbai, he said that the fact that Ganesha's head is an elephant head is a eminent proof that at that time there was such kind of plastic surgery prevalent in the society which could plant an elephant head on a human torso. So these are apparently their idea 
regarding what constitutes the Indian knowledge system and that is what they are planning to put into the curriculum. Okay, so from what you said, I could understand to some extent what is the hypothesis of this Indian knowledge system idea. But I would like to ask you what is wrong in the assumption that science and technology in ancient India was really advanced. Good. Uh, well, firstly, there are two, two issues I would like to raise. One, it has never been that before a certain thing has been invented by modern science, those who talk about those things, they have said that this existed. Nobody said that television existed before the television was invented by modern science and it came to daily use. Nobody said that uh, aeroplanes existed before aeroplanes came into daily use. Nobody said that plastic surgery was done before there was real plastic surgery in the modern modern era. So point is that only after certain thing has been discovered by modern science or invented by modern science, only then they say that this was there in the ancient era. Right. Second point, for example, take the, take the issue of the pushback camera. In order for an aircraft to be built, one has to have an idea of thermodynamics about aerodynamics, about uh, control theory, about various things that goes, a theoretical structure goes at the base of making any technology. A technology cannot be built just in the air. There has to be a theoretical development before that technology comes into existence. So if there is any evidence that there was an idea of thermodynamics, there was an idea about electrodynamics, there was an idea about hydrodynamics and all that. Before the, the, the Vedic age, I would definitely accept it. But there is absolutely no evidence, either uh, circumstantial evidence or documentary evidence, that any of these ideas exist. Thirdly, if the aircraft did exist, then at least one fragment will be found somewhere in any of the archaeological sites. Nothing has been found so far. So th therefore, my submission is that these are basically imaginations. Imaginations uh, are quite natural thing for humans. People do imagine. And therefore, these are also pieces of imagination. These are not really pieces of history. So if I think in the lines of what you said, then how should we understand the events that are described in these great epics, Mahabharata and Ramayana? And also this question often comes up that, aren't these elements of history? Well, these are epics, these are great stories, these are uh, products of the human mind, imagination, and the way any literature creates storylines to convey a message to the reader. In the same sense, the Ramayana and Mahabharata are also creations of the human mind, imagination, and they convey great ideas to the people. They convey the values of the time to them. But whether these are elements of history or not, the point is, that whenever a uh, literature creates a storyline that is always created out of his or her own experience. It experience in the sense that uh, when a modern day literature creates a story, that storyline is not true that that particular thing happened. But the cultural atmosphere and other things that bring that storyline was the cultural atmosphere of it. In a similar sense, the events depicted in the Ramayana and Mahabharata, these sort of uh, represent the cultural environment of the time, but there is no reason to believe that the events per se actually happened. If they had happened, for example, there should be some kind of archaeological evidence 
what is the biggest event biggest event in mahabharata the war the kurukshetra war and therefore if you go to the place called kurukshetra and dig it you should be finding some kind of evidence gada for example uh, in in that particular site nothing else and none of the uh, places that are said to be existing in the mahabharata or ramayana people have excavated and have found none therefore all that we can infer is that these are very good stories but stories epic stories they convey certain values to the people just imagine the this person called bharat he comes back to his home and finds that his elder brother has been sent to the forest by his own mother and he has suddenly become the king what does he do he runs after ram and to, to request him to come back now notice that this is a question of value and by reading that the reader gets a value system and therefore in that sense these are uh, epics in the sense that that conveys certain values but these are not elements of history nothing like that really happened but you can get a picture of the social condition of the time from this epics and the bhandarkar institute of oriental studies in pune they did a long term study on the history of these epics and they found that the language in different parts of these story lines in mahabharata for example in different parts the language is different the representative of the language used at different times and by piecing that together they found that these epics were written over a period of 6 to 800 years which means that it is not somebody sat down and wrote mahabharata or ramayana it's basically some story line that was added on to by different people by vocal verbal narration they added on to the stories and the last thing that was added was the gita part because there the language is the most recent and quite different from the language of the rest of the mahabharata therefore it is not that it was somebody writing history it's not like that it was basically these stories that that were prevalent in different areas all that put together as parts of a single story line mahabharata thank you professor banerji for this beautiful discussion and we will be having more content in these lines in the future so stay tuned for that if you like our content then please consider subscribing to our channel and like our videos and share with your near and dear ones and from the behalf of breakthrough science society we wish you a safe and healthy time ahead